ครับเฮ้ยทุกคนไรอันฟาวเลอร์อยู่ที่ intermasculine.com นี่คือ i n t e r g a m e Group I am now broadcasting from Costa Rica and yes my lighting sucks and my camera angle needs changing it'll be better next week but I just got here uh, Costa Rica is gorgeous um, the weather is actually much nicer than I expected not nearly as hot as I expected it to be in July it's just uh, great except when it rains But we have the inner gang group. We are doing part two of our deep dive into the science of hypnosis, with uh, examining a conversation between two Stanford scientists, two Stanford professors. One's a neuroscientist; the other is a psychiatrist who is considered one of the foremost foremost authorities in the world on hypnosis. So we have uh, they had a rather lengthy interview. We're going to look at th three more parts of it today, analyze it, pick it apart, discuss it in depth. Because there is science behind hypnosis, it's not just woohoo. And the way we do it, um, man, has just taken it to the next level. And we see this time after time after time, people's lives dr dramatically change. Um, sometimes as little as one session, in fact, oftentimes. But the rest of the group is with me today. So I'm Ryan Fowler, intermasculine.com forward slash free dash ebook. Go there and enter your email, get your free ebook. And we have Jordan and Tim today. Introduce yourselves, uh, Jordan Ford. I'm Jordan Kurtz. I'm with Jordan Kurtz Hypnosis. I help people end their limiting beliefs to unlock their full potential. And I realize Ryan and I kind of have the same saturation of shirt on today. Uh-oh. That's not <laughs> Yours is red and gray. I like different color though. So it's yeah, yours is red. Yours looks and bad. also I have a V-neck, so we're good. That's true. Yeah, I got my little, <laughs> I got my little gold chain. <clears throat> so tiny bit and of I'm, there. And I'm Tim Costello with uh, ClearThatTrauma.com. You can get me at Tim at ClearThatTrauma.com, or just go to the website, fill out the contact information. But essentially, like these other two fine gentlemen here in the Inner Game Group, we all help you live a better life by clearing. The subconscious trauma that troubles you 24/7. All right, Tim Costello, Jordan Kurtz, um, my dudes. So um, we are going to look at three different excerpts of this interview today. Very excellent interview, and <clears throat> I really like both of these scientists because, unlike many scientists, professors in the mental health field, they are actually open to all the. Um, cutting edge stuff, all the cutting edge developments. They're not just stuck on CBT, like so many, um, you know, quite honestly, if that's all you're doing, um, you're really selling yourself short. Um, if, if you're in, you know, the mental health field, self-improvement field, even that, you know, op optimizing your mindset, your performance, uh, mindset performance, man, you gotta be doing more than that. They understand that. So they are, um, <clears throat> you know, really um, going into this deep science, Dr. Spiegel, a lot of experience, more experience than me in this field. And so we're going to kind of dive in and go to the first clip, which is, uh, uh, Jordan, that's at 28 minutes, 22 seconds. Um, why don't you go yeah. ahead and set up this clip we're about to watch. I can't remember what it's about, but I know it's good and interesting. And we All right, cool. Stress um, and sleep. This one's about stress and sleep. Okay. okay. Let me get to that timestamp real quick and then we will dive in. I picked that timestamp last week and I. And then you moved to Costa Rica and got, <laughs> got um, <clears throat> just confused with the travel and all that. So totally understandable. All right, here we go. I want to return to some of the underlying neural networks and the uh, clinical applications, but uh, what sorts of um, things aside from the asthma um, have you used hypnosis successfully for, or have others used clinical hypnosis um, for? And are there any particular areas of, of psychiatric challenges or illnesses, I guess they're called, um, mm -hmm. that are particularly um, 
amenable to hypnotic treatment? Yes, there are. Hypnosis is very good as a problem focused uh, treatment. Um, it's really, it's the oldest Western conception of a psychotherapy and it can be used for specific problems in a way that's very helpful. Uh, we found it very helpful for stress reduction, um, for helping people deal. We're all dealing with stress these days. Um, and it's helpful. That mind body connection is very helpful because um, part of the problem with stress is your perception. You mentioned it earlier in a sort of good sense. You're at a you know, football game or something and feel the physical reaction. That can be a reinforcing thing. Wow, this is exciting. Let's do it. It can also be very distracting. So you're worried about getting COVID or you're worried about um, some other physical problem you have. And you, you notice it in your body. Your body tenses up. Uh, you start to sweat. The sympathetic nervous system goes. Your heart rate goes up. And when you notice that, you think, oh, God, this is really bad. And then you feel worse. So it's like a snowball rolling downhill. Uh, and, and then you feel worse. And then your body gets worse. Hypnosis can be very helpful in dissociating somatic reaction from psychological reaction. So we teach people to imagine their body floating somewhere safe and comfortable, like a bath, a lake, a hot tub, or floating in space. And then picture the problem that they're, that's stressing them on an imaginary screen with a rule that no matter what you see on the screen, you keep your body comfortable. So at this point, you can't, you still can't control the stress, but you can control your physical reaction to it. And that starts you feeling more in control. At least there's one thing I can manage. And then you can use it to think through or visualize through one thing you might do about that stressor. So hypnosis is very helpful in controlling mind-body interaction in relation to stress. You want to pause it there? It's very helpful. Yes, sir. So, that was interesting to me. Well, for a couple of reasons. The first thing he said was, it's the oldest psychotherapy. I don't know if you caught that, but yeah, I sure did. I was like, hmm, that's why, if it's the oldest, why isn't it used more often? But that was yeah, kind of and but, I, I think we've said it over and over yeah, again. But, but you times. guys want to take a stab at it before I sound like a yes, person. it's not connected to the pharmaceutical industry. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's uh it works too quickly it's too effective and so people can't make enough money off of it that's right you know yeah, and although thing, honestly they can we do just fine but they don't make uh as much as they could they don't get someone coming back for years or on medication for years or, or the rest of their life they don't get that yeah what do you guys I, well what do you think jordan so i analyzed this the second part he said, which the important part was when the stress comes in, he has them imagine the body floating in space or as they watch it on a screen. And I, I had two readings of that. One is they're changing the, the input to the system is the, the, the stress is the I'm nervous for a game, something like that. But I control my physical reaction. The second is I'm like dissociating from the feeling. So I don't because that's. I'm not quite sure what he means by that. Cause like the way we kind of work is we have them, we specifically yeah, we tell just them. Calm it down. It's, it's just a sort of a new narrative um, saying, Hey, you actually are fine. You can handle this. It's okay. You know, you're in a peaceful, you know, imagine you're in a peaceful place. I guess that would technically be dissociation because they're putting themselves in a place that's not where they are now, but you can also just take the route of giving yourself a new narrative, which we do all the time. And that, right. that actually keeps you connected with reality and handling the reality in an optimal way. So you could do either really, right? Yeah. I, I like the way he's describing, does it go far enough? So, cause I think we like to work with clients. They work with us once and they don't, struggle with a feeling of I'm not good enough in that same way again. And so I'm not sure if he's using hypnosis as a way of every time before you go to a game or ever before the football match, every time you go into a state of hypnosis, you watch the stresses on the screen and you dissociate from your body. Is that, is that kind of, I think that's what he means by using hypnosis in that way. And we're sort of taking a different approach of, we kind of want to really rewrite that belief system and the narrative when the stress comes up. So I guess it's subtle, but because we talk about kind of core beliefs about themselves. And so, but he's talking about, you know, I'm nervous before a football game, which might be what we talk about. So it like, it's interesting. So, so let me toss something in there sure. along the same lines. He's talking about stress. 
So the first question I would have for myself, if I were feeling anxious or stressed or nervous, what am I about to do? And why am I feeling that way? And most people, you know, will go through a little bit of introspection like that. But if it's a new thing for me to do, I'm going to be a little nervous. I'm going to be a little bit anxious in that I want to do it correctly, mainly because it's going to cost me money if I don't. But secondly, I don't want to waste time because time's the ultimate resource. That's okay, kind of stress and anxiety. That, that's something everybody deals with every single day. But if you're approaching some situation, um, my wife, for example, um, because her dad and grandfather yelled at her a lot, every time she works for a man and she gets called to the office, she gets anxious and stressed out because there's a pattern matching from when she was young that now she feels in her body. It's usually her gut, her chest, that kind of thing. Yeah. That kind of stress and anxiety is what we deal with. Because now, rather than disassociating with that particular anxiety or stress, we desire to go into the root, find out, like Ryan says, what the narrative is that's running in your subconscious around that particular stress environment or stress trigger. And then we remove that narrative and the emotion attached to that narrative and then rewrite that narrative to serve that person more. Because what's the thing that most of us have heard? past the hypnosis sessions we've done is that didn't trigger me or I'm much better about this. I mean, everybody's yeah, normally I'd be freaking gone, out at this moment, but most of not. it, it has been gone. Right. So just some thoughts in there about what he's saying. Yeah. Now, um, thank you, Tim. A couple of things to add to that is you can go in and permanently rewire your subconscious programs. We do it day in, day out. But you can also use this um, for some sort of temporary effect. Um, mm -hmm. Self-talk will do that. Hypnosis will do that at a deeper level. You know, with self-talk, um, if something happens and it doesn't go your way and you're disappointed, you can just tell yourself, hey, it's not so bad. Well, you can, and then you feel a little better. Uh, you can amplify that effect with hypnosis through certain um, visualizations and whatnot. You can, um, the interesting thing here, we, um, you can do is we can tell our brain how to be and what to do. You know, last week they talked about how they um, hypnotize people to lower or raise the stomach acid in their stomach by imagining certain things. You know, our brain's a wonderful instrument and hypnosis is really the art of accessing a deeper part of our subconscious and mastering it, reprogramming it, fixing it. It is a skill. When you do a session with us, we lend our skill to help you get big results, but you can actually teach the skill to yourself. I fix 95% of my issues with self-hypnosis, doing it on myself. Um, I had to learn a lot of stuff over the years. I had some very big results up front because I got a self-hypnosis program, but you, um, I literally went in, found these deep parts, healed myself, but you can also temporarily affect your mood with um, with different techniques that can get you, you know, grounded for the day. You know, you do something in the morning, then you do that. You do well the rest of the day. This is where meditation comes in. A lot of people feel good for the day. If they start with meditation, they're more grounded, they're more focused, they're in the moment. Um, they're not as easily rattled. So you, you can have a temporary effect or, um, or a permanent rewiring uh, effect with this. And I think he's talking more about temporary management and the truth yeah. is um i have way 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 less stress than before but we'll never be free of stress you can have right. an immaculate subconscious mind you're still going to have some stress and some anxiety because that's how our brain's designed you know uh, like i tell people if you're on a mountain path two feet wide it's a thousand foot drop on your right you should be fearful and anxious that emotion's keeping you alive it's keeping you safe or it's making you take a different path that's that's safer and that's how our brain is supposed to work. So um, we just get things, uh, our brain working for us so it serves us and doesn't hold us back. And and yeah, you can do it temporarily. You can do it the way Dr. Spiegel's talking about. There's other techniques. Um, you can also permanently rewire it. Um, it really is fascinating and amazing the scope of what you can do to your own brain with these various hypnosis techniques. I mean, it's 
The, this is really powerful stuff, guys. Uh, I have a 12-week course, and I am teaching people how to train their own brain certain ways and mas master their emotions, master their brain. That's really what this is. It's great. Anything else to add before we go on? Yeah, I'm good. So I think for people watching, it's useful to identify whether or not <clears> – <throat> Like, I think everyone needs to have that permanent change inside their mind. Like, oh, yeah. otherwise you're constantly, you can use things like affirmations and positive self-talk. But if you find that you have to keep, you have to keep using them, otherwise you feel awful. It, that's probably. Oh, yeah, that, you need to permanently do something. Yeah. Right. And so permanent fix there. when you feel good internally and use affirmations and positive self-talk, you reinforce what's already there but if you're trying to override bad belief systems with affirmations journaling positive self-talk not nearly that's enough. An endless process yeah and so what he's talking about is something you can do when it comes up but it it's like you have to be careful that you're not trying to are you amplifying the good things that are already inside of you or are you trying to override the bad things that are inside of you? Or I shouldn't say bad because, or the, I should say unhelpful now, things that are unhelpful now inside of you. So to add a cute analogy to that, if you have a slow leak in your tire, you can have that slow leak in your tire for two years. And once a week, you can go to the gas station and you can pump up that tire again to its proper uh, pressure and continue to drive, right? But eventually, in about a week, it's going to be low enough down to 20 PSI that you're going to have to pump it up again. So to Jordan's point, That's, why not just get the tire fixed so you don't have to keep pumping it up? So you go to the root cause of the leak rather than just, yeah, it's losing air. I'll put more air in. That definitely is a fix. But how about stopping it from losing air? Because now the air can be helpful and not unhelpful. Yeah, very good. And and I mean, this is, we are optimizing your subconscious mind. It's, it's not just getting trauma out, but everyone needs this because no one just comes out of the box having, being a master of their mind, being a master of their emotions, being a master of their internal narratives and self-talk and thought processes and do that. And, um, your life is just going to improve in all areas. Um, so I'm a fan of temporary stuff and I'm a fan of permanent. I say do it all. Um, yeah, but very buddy. good analogy, Tim. Go ahead, Jordan. I was going to say, Tim reminded me I need new tires. <laughs> but, ah, excellent. <laughs> but we can, uh, I think you can play the clip a little more. I don't remember if there's more. Uh, there might be. But yeah. I think that's just a Go ahead. Yeah, I'll do that. Be helpful for people to get to sleep. Uh, we're having a lot of fun with that. I, I've, I'm getting emails from people who said, you know, I haven't slept right in 15 years. And now for the first time, um, you know, I'm listening to your app and I can sleep at night. You know, I literally had that happen. One guy couldn't get more than two hours of sleep a night uh, for like the last six years. Uh, listened to one self hypnosis, slept for 10 hours straight. It happens all the time. It's part the of the reason. So it's very, and the, hey, that? hang on a second. And the reason is because your subconscious is running 24-7 even when you're trying to sleep. So if it wants to bring things up and keep you awake, it'll do it. Yeah. And I mean, we can tell our brain what to do to a great degree. We can rewire it. We can tell it to go to sleep. We could tell it, Hey, produce more stomach acid, less stomach acid, um, stress out more, stress out less. We have a, a if you understand these skills consciously, but most importantly, subconsciously, you have a tremendous amount of influence over your mind and, and all this stress, falling asleep, staying awake, whatever. That's all that's all up to your brain. It is all up to your brain whether you fall asleep or stay awake. If you want to go unconscious, you're, you, that's up to your brain. That's 100% a brain function. So when you learn to master this, you get all these benefits because your brain is like the core of all our behavior, emotions, thoughts. I mean... Duh, it is incredibly important to the quality of our lives. And so, so you way, enhance every area of your life when you learn these skills. Go duh ahead, is a scientific t t term for you should know this. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I'm just being Captain Obvious, right? I like, know. I'm just being you know, funny. We'll, yeah. So, well, Ryan, that, yeah. Real quick, that person who found they could sleep better, what was – was there trauma that was holding them back from – Oh, yeah, absolutely. Sleep? Or, like, was it trauma around sleeping or was it? No, uh, the guy's brother um, committed, you know, self-deleted six years. Or no, he didn't self-delete. He was killed in Iraq. Mm-hmm. And um, that trauma uh, made it so he couldn't, he'd wake up screaming. He'd only get two hours of sleep a night. He'd have oh. this dream over and over again of his brother dying. It was. Uh, so it know, wasn't. Really- okay. So it was, it wasn't, he was, had trauma around sleep. It was, he couldn't he sleep. He had trauma period. Yeah, because and but I was gonna say because not everyone reacts to trauma that way, but mm-hmm. that's so it, like to clarify, it wasn't the trauma itself was causing it. It was the he he's he wakes up in the middle of breast because that's so intense. So yeah, exactly. Yeah, we keep going. Very helpful. And again, you know, if you wake up in the middle of the night, you know, I I, I tell people don't look at the clock. That's an arousal cue. You know, you just you wake up more, um, but. A mad picture, whatever you're thinking about or worrying about on that imaginary screen while your body's floating. So watch your own movie, but keep your body floating. And many people can use that to get back to sleep. I've been using the self-hypnosis for sleep for a long time. Um, and now the Reverie app, and we'll talk about our relationship to the Reverie app and its uses. I find it incredibly useful for falling back asleep in the middle of the night. Uh, and it raises a, a question um, I've found, and I think I understand this correctly, that one can do self-hypnosis during the daytime and then if there's an issue that comes up later, like, so for instance, uh, do self-hypnosis for stress reduction away from the stressful event to prepare one mm-hmm. to deal with stress better right. or do uh, hypnosis for improving the return to sleep. And that can be done when you actually want to go to sleep, but it's, it's right. a kind of a training up of these networks, right? That's um, right. Is, so is there evidence that these brain networks actually form stronger um, connections when people do self-hypnosis over time? Um, yeah, well, there's a rule in neurobiology, as you know, that neurons that fire together wire together. Yeah, our friend Carla Schatz. Yes, yeah, Carla. Not Donald Hebb, by the way. I keep trying to – there's a there's a, there's a widespread myth. Is this part worth watching too or do you want to skip ahead? No. Uh, we can, we, yeah, we can skip ahead. I mean he okay. basically just says there that you know, they're using kind of what we already talked about, which was that you, know, you can use it before the game. You, you kind of prep yourself and you're kind of trying to develop a, a pattern of, okay, every time I'm before a game, I'm – preparing myself for this kind of stuff. So it's, it's more of the same. Okay, cool. Now we're getting to an especially interesting part. It's really core to what we do. Restructuring trauma narratives. Very, very, very important. And by the way, everyone has some trauma because no one has a perfectly safe, nurturing, loving upbringing. There's always, you know, some people have a very good upbringing overall, some a terrible one. Everyone has at least a little trauma. So this applies to everyone as well. You may think it doesn't, Trust me, it does. We underestimate our ability to regulate and, and change responses, to be cognitively, emotionally, and somatically flexible. And so we do things, you're right, that follow similar principles of facing a problem, seeing it from a different point of view. And you've done a really a nice podcast on trauma and stress and how you have to expose yourself to it, not avoid it, as we talked about before, and then find some way to reconnect to it, to substitute something that can make you feel good rather than bad. Um, so that you activate other centers of the brain, like the mesolimbic reward system. And so I do that with hypnosis, and you can do it much faster. Uh, People don't think they can, but they can. He's going into an analogy about a woman in a moment, but, I mean, he just said it right there. You have to connect to the trauma first. You don't move away from it. You connect to it and then let it go or reprogram it or however you want to say it. Yeah, and this is very important for audience, very, very, very core. A subconscious, a bad subconscious program, traumatic subconscious program has two aspects. It is a belief tied to a feeling. The feeling is is the traumatic feeling and there's a narrative tied to it. What happens with this trauma is we go through life and anytime there's anything in the outside world that's a match for that belief, it spikes the feeling and trauma is always painful. It's always painful feelings. The most effective way to reprogram that is to address both the emotion and the narrative. You can do one or the other and be very effective. I've I've done that. When I started, um, my self-hypnosis cured my depression that 15 years of therapy couldn't completely cure. Um, There's still a really big chunk there. 
two months it was cured and the self-hypnosis worked on the emotion um, much more than the narrative, much more. And it's it cured me. So you can do one. Uh, I know hypnotherapists who totally ignore the emotions, which I think is a bad idea, but they do. They are very good with redoing the narrative and they do a lot of good. They can be very effective that way. But man, when you handle both, it is just the emotion and the narrative. It is just freaking awesome how powerful that can be. And yeah, so just FYI, Spark 55, welcome to the show. I, I see all you guys, uh, regulars coming back. We appreciate it. Um, Jay Lee and also my my man. Yeah, so um, anything else you guys want to say before we go on? No, I think we did this, but I love the trauma narrative that they go over. Yeah, yeah, this is a, this story coming up is good. Here we go. And if you're having right now that physical experience, I'm thinking about this, but I'm not feeling as bad as I used to. Um, that can be a powerful thing and you can do it with hypnosis. So I had a, a woman came to see me who had suffered an attempted rape. It was getting dark. She was coming back from the grocery store and this guy grabs her and wants to get her up into her apartment. It's outside her apartment. And she starts fighting with him and she winds up with a basilar skull fracture. He runs away. Um, the cops come. Since she hadn't been raped, they left. They weren't interested. And she wanted to use hypnosis to get a better image of what this guy looked like, which is a painful, upsetting thing. So she was quite hypnotizable. I got her floating. I said, you're safe and comfortable now. Nothing can happen that will harm your body. But on, on the left side of the screen, I want you to picture this guy and his approaching and what's happening. And she said, I really, it, the light, it was getting dark. I really can't see much of his facial features. But I do recognize something I hadn't allowed myself to remember. If he gets me upstairs, he doesn't just want to rape me. He's going to kill me. And so in some ways, what she was seeing was even worse. So, you know, you're thinking, good, Spiegel, you made her even more frightened than she was before. But as you had pointed out in your PTSD stress lecture, you've got to confront the trauma to, to restructure your understanding of it. We call it feel it to heal it. So on the other side of the screen, I had her picture. Um, um, what, what are you doing to protect yourself? And everybody in a trauma situation engages in some strategy of self-protection. You know, that's the salience network kicking in. And um, she said, you know what? He's surprised and I'm fighting that hard. He didn't think I would. Yeah. And so she realized on the one hand that it was even worse than she thought it was. But on the other hand, that she actually probably saved her life. And so it was a way of helping her restructure her experience of the trauma and make it more tolerable. So that helped with her. She didn't recognize, she, she couldn't identify the guy, but it helped her restructure and understand her experience. And that's something that you can do in just talking straight out psychotherapy, but sometimes you can do it a hell of a lot faster and more efficiently using hypnosis. And there is one randomized trial out of Israel. So he's, he's redoing the narrative there. You can actually redo the narrative. And just like you can tell your brain, hey, I want less stomach acid. I want more stomach acid. I want to fall asleep. You can literally tell your brain this, this traumatic emotion in me this negative energy, get it out of me. Yeah. And so that's where we're kind of, you know, honestly doing stuff at a higher level. I mean, no, no disrespect to these guys at all. I think they're fantastic people, but we deal, we deal directly with the trauma, traumatic emotion and the narrative. And it's, it's just double the effect. Um, you guys I'm have a little shocked. Now. So when he says that somebody connected to this emotion rewrote the narrative, whatever, and then they felt better or they felt less traumatic about that event, why wouldn't they initially trigger right into that, into research to figure out exactly how to do that? Because if that immediate response is there, that means more of that immediate response can be gained. So why wouldn't they go that path of hypnosis as these super smart scientists. It's interesting to me that they don't see that as the avenue they need to branch out into and look at. Yeah. I mean, the, the scientists know, you know, they're telling you this is much faster, much more effective than traditional methods. Um, I, I do think part of it is just straight up ignorance of the masses. Uh, when I say the masses, I mean professionals who help others with trauma. Um, I also think, by the way, that a lot of this, um, uh, approach of working on the emotion, not the narrative, comes from energy healers, and the scientists all think those people are just way too woohoo. But there's actually, and there are a lot of energy healing methods I don't agree with that I think are like, yeah, I'm not so sure that works. Um, but 
Um, it's, it's kind of unfortunate. They only work on the narrative because I hundreds of times done it on myself, done on others. When you work on the narrative and the emotion, um, it is, I mean, just so much more. Have you guys noticed that? Cause you guys work on the emotion too and say, Hey, send it away into the tornado. Of light. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you have you guys- to get, so the, the best part of what we do is rewrite the narrative because at least if the narrative is rewritten to serve you, there will be less of that emotion attached to it. However, in the future, something that we might not have gotten to could still trigger that emotion that was similar in pattern. So it's better to not only rewrite the narrative, but to remove the emotion and the trauma in that narrative so that that doesn't come back at all. So you're hundred percent right, Ryan. And that's why I do it. Yeah, man. And I just, someone just messaged me on Instagram yesterday. He's like, you did a session for me a year ago. If I didn't do it, I would have killed myself and I'm not viewing porn. I'm not playing video games. I got toxic people out of my life who otherwise would have been very difficult to let go. That was one session. <clears throat> yeah. One session, you know, it's very so, powerful. And, and honestly, working on just the narrative in hypnosis, very powerful. Working on just the emotion can be very powerful. Man, you put them both together, holy crap. You so know, you know and- what I really love is the word, the word empowering. Because in society today and all through business and stuff, especially in the HR world, everybody wants to be empowered. What they think that means is that they get more power. But in actuality, it, the empowerment is the result of not only <clears throat> having a process and that process given a tool and those two together given a strategic narrative. Now, let's pretend I was at Walmart and I used to tell my and, you know, I took over a store and it took me about a year to get to everybody to have them understand what empowerment was. One, I gave them a process. Two, I gave them a tool to help with that process. And then three, I gave them the strategic direction as to why they're even doing that thing. Now they became empowered to run my store for me. So at the end of the day, after a year of rewiring this store, um, my associates ran the store, not me. They were able to make decisions. They didn't have to come to me for everything. They were able to take charge. And let me tell you, the last two and a half years, in that store was kissing babies and shaking hands. This is the exact same thing that we're doing for people. We give them a tool, hypnosis or self-hypnosis. We give them the process, which is rewriting the narrative and rewriting the emotion or removing the emotion. And then the strategic direction is to help them live a better life. That's the ultimate goal. So now they that guy that you mentioned, Ryan, he is 100% empowered to take over his life and run it the way he really wants to. Yeah. And you know, honestly, he still has work to do, but the change Always. is massive. And I, I'm actually doing, I have a 12 week course right now with, um, I don't know, seven guys in it, seven, maybe eight soon. And, you know, group training and over the 12 weeks, honestly, I probably only need eight or 10, but uh, I'm actually teaching them how to do this on themselves. Because like I said, I fix 95% of my stuff without even trying within two years, my income doubled. Then I actually tried and then it doubled again. And I set the intention first, the mindset. I got our my subconscious supercomputer um, working for me. So this is a skill you can learn. Um, we can do it for you. We can teach you how to do it for yourself. Now, Spark55 has a great question here. Yep. Hi, guys. Last stream, you guys said that you find triggers before actually hypnotizing. How do you find these triggers? Well, I have a process called Dive to the Five. There's five types of sub bad subconscious programs, uh, subconscious trauma. Number one, you're not, you feel not good enough in some way. It could be mild. It could be extreme, takes different forms, but somehow you're not good enough falling short or you're worthless or a creep or just weird or whatever. Number two, you don't belong. You don't fit in. Number three, you cannot get what you want. Maybe you're not allowed. Maybe you feel you're not worthy. Maybe you feel you're not capable. However, it applies to you. Uh, number four, anger, resentment, rage, bitterness, disappointment over betrayal, abuse. You're angry at yourself, others, uh, some unfairness. Someone should have did something and they didn't or 
shouldn't have done something and they did. Number five, feeling unsafe. So someone comes to uh, me, we look at what they struggle with. We trace it down to which of these five is it? How does it apply? When we actually write out, what we're doing is we're writing out the subconscious narrative by going through this exploration process. And when we write out or, or we say out loud to the client, the belief that's in them, it triggers that belief. And once it's triggered, your brain's connected to it. We then say, hey, brain, in hypnosis, we say, hey, brain, this trauma, this bad narrative, this painful feeling you're feeling right now, send it away. And with the techniques we use, it goes away. And, Let me add uh, something to that, Ryan. Not and to and you, I'm teaching people how to do this to themselves all on their own with, with my uh, self-hypnosis audio. And it's very effective. Now, Go key ahead. to what Ryan said there, Spark 55, is – we don't actually find these triggers. You tell us what they are because the we questionnaire that Ryan's talking about them. with dive to the five is you're going to write out the things that you are struggling with and the things that cause you to not be as effective as you want to be. And we just yeah. help you refine those prior to go into hypnosis, but you actually tell us what they are and we just help you tweak them to make them as powerful as they can so when we go into hypnosis, they're easier to remove because you're feeling them very strongly. Yeah, there's, yeah. Some, there's definitely some detective work that we do. We really just, when you meet with us, like the way most of our sessions work are you meet with us for 30 minutes, an hour, and then we schedule a session. And during that initial meetup, we are, typically most clients come to us with a problem that they're noticing. I procrastinate a lot. I don't feel good enough. I feel bad around other people. And then we ask a series of questions like, "Is it, when is it strongest? When do you not feel it? When, when is this worse? How, what are you worried is going to happen if this happens? So we kind of, really what we're trying to do is help you see kind of where these traumas or limiting beliefs fit into that, those five that Ryan mentioned. And we're kind of trying to, we don't really know when, when a client comes to us, we kind of, we've seen enough clients where we kind of can predict where things are going to end up, but we really just are there as a guide for your own subconscious mind. We're just asking the right questions to help you kind of go down the path. And that's, you know, what, what Ryan's course will do is help you, self troubleshoot that's where you know i think myself and ryan have gotten to where when we experience things or in the past when we've tried to work on ourselves we do the same process you know when i when i notice traumas in my own life that i'm trying to clear i go through the same process i ask certain questions when is it worse when is it you know better you know how is that gonna you know? so you just kind of keep asking good questions. You keep being curious about the feeling until you kind of land on something and you'll know it. You'll feel it. It's like, Ooh, you'll say something out loud and you go, Ooh, I, that really, that really got me right there. And so that's kind of the, the nature of the process. Um, yeah. And I did just come out with a self hypnosis program. I'm it's just, um, uh, I've just been offering it to former clients, but next week I'm going to do a show that kind of gives you guys an overview if you want access to that you can then have it and that actually teaches you how to do this on yourself and uh it comes with one group training webinar with me as well if you want more in-depth training like one-on-one -on -one, that's available too but I'll, I'll do the video and give you guys the overview next week and then if you want access you can get that but um it's a skill. Go. It's a and skill you can develop. We do it for you, guiding you one on one, or you develop the skill and do it for yourself. I have more thoughts on the the woman uh, problem. Okay. Thing. So you want to play more of it, or uh, more no? I think okay. we played enough. It, it was we, we were talking about this idea of trauma, of like narrative versus the, the feeling, and I I think. Like she's trying to rewrite the narrative in her head so she can she can cope with it better. Yep. But I think a lot of clients come to us because they feel bad about themselves in a certain way. And so if you don't remove those feelings, it's like 
That's the most immediate impact. And so the narrative is tied to that feeling, but setting the feelings away and rewrite, like they have to go together because they're so intimately tied together that I don't know how you can remove one without the other. Now, if I've had clients who have come to me because they feel worthless and in the process of doing, like they talk to the people through Gestalt therapy who made them feel that way. And then they were able to let those feelings go just in that process. And sometimes it yeah. can happen. But I think the key, the reason why they don't have to have to, because we use something called a tornado of light to send these feelings away. Sometimes when I haven't done that or haven't needed to do it is because they have, the tornado is a good analogy of imagining these feelings leaving your body. But some people can do that on their own without even needing that visualization. They just, they're connected enough with the feeling that they just kind of understand how that process works kind of intuitively and they can do that. We use this analogy because it's helpful for a lot of people to kind of see that happening. But if they're talking to their mom who made them feel worthless and they said, you know what, mom, you no longer have this power over me to be worthless and I'm going to let this go right now. I've had clients say that yeah. out loud. I'm going to let then you put it. They have a new narrative and that, sometimes that's enough and the trauma leaves on its own. Yeah, right. Yeah. So I did that. I did that yesterday. I was just putting new narratives in a guy taking old out, you know, um, this is a lie. This belief is a lie. It's not true. It doesn't apply to me. This is why. And here's the truth. And you put the new narrative in and I cleared like three traumas and I, I used like the tornado of light once at the very end and didn't even really need it. Um, other than that, he just kept letting stuff go, like going down to zero and it's like, oh, okay, it's gone. No need for the tornado, you know? That's right. Yeah. But a lot of times I put in a new narrative and I'm like, what's the feeling at now? We have them rate the internal negative feeling zero to 10. And um, a lot of times they're say, it's like, oh, it's still there. It's a four out of 10. It's a two out of 10. It's a lot better, but they still need to clear the actual emotional trauma tied to the narrative as well. It just depends. We attack it from both angles. And as I've, uh, I first started less narrative and more just focusing on the trauma, sending it away because that's how I learned it. But as I got into, you know, reprogramming the narrative, it's not just getting rid of the bad narrative. It's putting a very good narrative in to replace it. And as I've done that, it's just gotten more and more effective, bigger and bigger results. They were already quite massive. Yeah, these are just tools that you can use. Yeah. And it's up to the hypnotist to deploy them appropriately for the client. We call it client's client-centered hypnosis. Now, we have all these tools in our toolbox and we work with a client. Generally, we use the same tools every time, but how we use them, when we use them, that's, it's up to our own kind of experience with the client and what they need most at the time. All right, very good. Now, I think we have one final one at uh, hour 20 one in 43 seconds i'll go to that do you remember what this one is about jordan um the last one i think it was yes it was more stress and trauma stuff okay here we go discussion and in our um discussions that um, i have the great fortune of talking to you every week is uh, and working together is this idea of getting close to the phobia getting close to the trauma re-experiencing it as a portal to then adjusting the response to it and rewiring something so the troubling thing or the horrible thing is no longer har as horrible to us that but the, the the repeating theme is we can't expect to get over something without getting really close to it maybe even experiencing it somatically hallelujah nowadays we hear a lot about you know triggers and by the way 2020 did a um thing on past life regression they had three got three people with phobias and all the phobias completely gone after one session. I mean, they were going to past lives. You can look into that, you know, look at that how you will. But resolving phobias it can be extremely effective. Like one session, totally gone. I mean, all the time that happens, we we do that. Trigger warnings, and um, certainly one can understand why those are why those exist. But it seems like there's a in the general population there's this idea that. We want to move away from anything that upsets us. And yet right. I think it's fair to say, even though I haven't gathered the statistics that on the whole, that the uh, human beings are becoming more and more anxious and more and more stressed, perhaps uh, because of, but certainly in parallel with the fact that we're trying to move away from troubling things, troubling things. So I've heard you say before that it's 
in terms of therapeutic approaches, it's not just about the state you get into, but whether or not you brought yourself there voluntarily. That's exactly right. So the, this element of, of deliberate self-exposure, deciding I'm going to confront the trauma, I'm going to confront the pain, I'm going to confront the insomnia, I'm going to confront the, you know, and fill in the blank. And then readjusting one's emotional response right up next to that troubling thing. That seems to be the, the hallmark of, of this treatment. And um, if I'm thinking about it correctly, of pretty much all treatments for getting over stuff. If people don't have access to a really good clinician like yourself, how should they carry these thoughts and these ideas? I mean, I think almost everybody of any reasonable age has memories or things that upset them, but we learn to suppress them. What does one do? Uh, obviously, the Reverie app has approaches to dealing with some of this um, inside of the app. Um, but how does one start to think about actually dealing with something like this and avoiding the hazards of just kind of reactivating a lot of painful experiences? Because a lot of being a functional human being is also going to work each day, interacting with people right. and not bringing one's trauma, you know, dumping it out all on the table or, or being able to just function is so crucial. So how do you think about this as a clinician? Um, well, you know, I, the image that comes to mind is the Greek myth of Pandora's box, you know, that it opened and the furies got out and you couldn't put them back in. And we have this kind of fantasy that once you get into these memories, they'll take you over and you'll never get them back in the box. And I think that's wrong. You know, we, we people who... By the way, I agree. Whether that trauma's in the box or not, whether you've suppressed it or not, it is there and it is messing up your life until you get... Whether you face it or not, it is messing up your life. You, you might get temporarily triggered uh, going in and looking at it, and that's really painful. But honestly, it's happening on and off throughout your life anyways. Whether or not you face this in hypnosis, it's getting triggered one way or another, triggered anyways. And if you're completely disconnected to it, in many ways, that's even worse because yep. of how that messes you up. Constant anxiety, stress, et cetera, shut down. Um, you know, the, 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 the guy in his mom's basement stone on weed all day, the alcoholic who can't stop drinking, you just shut the stuff <clears throat> out and it'll mess you up one way or another. So you might as well face it and heal it. Yeah. Any, any it'll bad? manifest. You can't, I, I don't really know if you ever can suppress it. It's like, play, like you can suppress you it, can. In, one you can. You it in the moment. It's, it's going to run. It finds the match. It's going to trigger. Right. Yeah. Period. And so, yeah, it, it will. And people, yeah, you can make it so you don't feel it in the moment. But what do you have to do to make it so you don't feel it in the right. moment? This is where addiction comes in. People numb out, or you just totally disconnect. If you disconnect from your feelings, you disconnect from them all. You can't pick and choose. Um, I say the one exception is some people can stay connected to anger while shutting everything else down. But besides that, you shut emotions down. You shut them all down. You shut down your love. You shut down your empathy, your compassion, your joy, your desire, your motivation. You're going to shut down all that good stuff in order to disassociate and numb out the pain. Even if, and I've seen this a lot, even if you're not resorting to drugs or addiction, you're just yep. straight up dissociating. It, it just, it, by the way, when you disconnect from your intuition and anxiety that many instances say, hey, don't do that. And it's serving us because, hey, don't do that. That's a bad idea. And it really is. You start making really bad life choices because you don't have that keeping you from that. Those emotions keeping you from making bad life choices. So people end up doing really stupid stuff when they are disconnected from their core yeah, and they mess pick. up their lives. You don't get to pick. You either suppress all the emotions or. Yeah, you can. Um, the only thing I've seen is people can suppress everything and stay connected to anger. That's actually what social paths do. But beyond that, it's 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 all on or all off, more or less. Yeah. And so why not just remove the bad so you can experience the good? Yeah. I mean, the trauma is messing you up one way or another. You got you just got to get rid of it, e even if you have to face it and it hurts for a moment. Well, then your life is forever after better once you clear it. So keep going use hypnosis say that there are ways to present things to people that will be helpful in ways that won't and one real mistake is to tell someone don't think about purple elephants you know what are you thinking about you know it doesn't work so you want to find a way to feel in control of the access and to define what happened on your own terms um and so i'm not a big fan of trigger warnings i think we're going crazy over you know this could be upsetting that could be upsetting yeah there are lots of things that are upsetting you know the average kid as well. That's absolutely true. They've done experiments to find out just talking about racism makes you see racism everywhere, even if it's not there. Yes, there is this one. Ex there is this. I'll let you talk in a sec, Jordan. They did this experiment 
where they um, put on um, prosthetics and makeup to make a person look disfigured. And then they show that person in the uh, mirror, hey, we're doing this. You, you look, they see themselves disfigured, looking like they got in a car wreck and their face was all messed up. They see it in the mirror and they say, now you're going to go out and buy a car and note how people treat you. And then right before they left, they said, oh, we just want to touch up your makeup real quick. And they actually removed all the makeup. So the person looks normal now. It was actually an attractive person. Then goes out to the car dealership trying to buy a car. They come back reporting all sorts of discrimination against them for their looks, not realizing they went out looking normal, not disfigured. So just by thinking, oh, the world's racist. Oh, you know, people are discriminating against me. Just by even mentioning that, you are going to be biased towards seeing that more than you would otherwise. Go ahead, right. Jordan. Well, because he says in there, like, don't, like, just not acknowledging it doesn't make it not go away. Like, it's still there. Because he's talking about, oh, just feel, when you tell people, oh, just feel better. Oh, just get over it. You know, that's kind of some of the narratives we hear from other content creators of you just got to get over it just work through it just do the work just just power through it's like well they give that, you no tools to resolve that trauma yeah it's like but you can't just do it that way those are all conscious kind of overrides but again you can only hit the you can and you can hit the override button a lot of times there's no limit how many times you hit the override button but it gets exhausted I, i'd say there is a limit you you can do it so much and then you're worn out it takes a lot of energy. You see, if you see an attractive girl and your anxiety is nine out of 10, you may muster up the courage to do it once. You're not going to talk to, if you're at some social event, you're not going to meet five or 10 girls that night and then take out the one who likes you back or of multiple, the one you like the most. You're going to get up all your courage and approach one if you're lucky. And then you're just psychologically worn out. Yep. If that if that anxiety is very low, now you can mingle and, and meet all sorts of, of ladies that you normally would otherwise have a lot of anxiety towards. And because a lot less effort, a lot, lot less anxiety. Our willpower only takes us so far. you got to get this stuff sorted. That's why my income doubled within two years, you know, is I got all this crap out and I didn't have to put in any more effort. In the past, my effort was geared towards resolving anxiety. Um, yeah, e EC Smooth actually knows. Uh, um, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's funny, but it's it's uh, yeah, that's true. Um, anyways, like, you, yeah, you go can ahead. Get, you can get pretty far by just ignoring your feelings, but you'll you'll get a lot farther, a lot faster, and a lot easier if you don't. You have your feelings on your side. It is a, it's like a superpower that you can't even imagine. When you don't have to force yourself to think positive. You just think positive. It's so much less effort because then you're not like constantly worried about, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm getting stressed again. Got to do my breathing exercise. Got to do my meditation. Got It's like, no, you just don't. You just are. You just be. You just enjoy life <laughs> there's not this constant worry of okay if i do this i gotta do two deep breaths and do the the double breathing that i think huberman i mean that that helps stuff. I, I say do it but you gotta do more so you just know, remember just remember that emotional trauma is just as exhausting as physical trauma your body has to have time to recuperate that time uh, is, I don't want to say wasted because you are recuperating either physically or emotionally, but it is now time that you can't do anything else. Yeah. So that's why Ryan's income doubled. He didn't put more effort in. He just focused the effort and was rested and got up and his brain was in a better place than not. Yeah, my effort was not focused on dealing with my anxiety, dealing with doubt dealing with anger and rage over what happened to me as a kid. It wasn't right. focused on that. It was focused on being productive, kicking ass yep. and living a good life. And yeah, so it changes everything. Uh, we're not, you, you can ignore your emotions. That's not a good idea. 
You can cope with them better or best you can master them. We are about permanent programming, we rewiring, optimizing your subconscious, and then also with cognitive tools, mastering your mind, your emotions, optimizing it so you just naturally kick more ass. And that's what Dr. Spiegel's talking about. It's like you can't, yeah. it's not a good idea to just shove these, shove this stuff away, you know. And, you know, I think, you know, trying to, try to figure out what to say. It's like he's, like he's, he says it right there. Like this stuff is well known. And I, I just think hypnosis is the best tool to enable you to not have, like, I, I think some people are like, well, pushing my feelings away. I, I have no better tool because I like cognitive behavioral therapy doesn't make me feel any better. I just go and talk about it and it seems to make it worse. And so I can, I can understand why some people may, or so, even some coaches or some content creators might get in the habit of, okay, you just have to get over it or just keep pushing forward when you don't know that there are better tools that exist. Yeah, they, don't, they just don't know. You know what? Better. They yeah. There there are many great tools out there, and I recommend a lot of tools to a lot of people to help them. But number one, this hypnosis that we do, this hypnotherapy, trauma removal, is the strongest tool in the toolbox. And that's the one you use first because it's going to enhance every other tool because so much is out of the way now. Yeah, typically the other tools complement and supplement it. Hypnosis yes. is the core. I, I agree. Um, Spark has a good question. Um, by the way, Tim knows I used to procrastinate like crazy. He <laughs> he'd come. He used to work with me, and he he'd come to my house because home office. And it's like twelve thirty. I'm still sleeping because I didn't want to face the day, you know. Or like, oh man, I need to get my swamp cooler set up, and I'm just too scared, and I wouldn't set it up unless someone helped me. Um, so now with procrastination, is that usually a fear? Uh, with most people or a narrative problem. Well, a, a painful subconscious program is a painful emotion tied to a narrative. It's both parts. What fear is, what anxiety is, any sort of resistance. And they they said this earlier, Dr. Um, Huberman and Spiegel, how people want to run away. They want to avoid pain. Our brain motivates us towards pleasure, but above all, avoid pain. So if you're putting anything off, that means your brain senses there is a potential pain if you do it. So think of a task. Oh, I have, you know, I have this task to do. Okay, what could go wrong? Well, maybe you mess it up and other people mock you for messing it up. Maybe you feel bad because you failed or made a mistake. Maybe you feel bad just because you feel lazy if you don't do it. But your brain, that can cause procrastination. All your brain sees is the event, potential pain. It gives you resistance. And that's why people procrastinate. And there can be a lot of anxiety tied to procrastination, but some people um, pursue pleasure above all, avoid pain and use pleasure to cover pain. Hey, let's just play video games. Let's uh, smoke weed, view porn, whatever. Forget about this task. Let's do something fun. People do that a lot too. But if you're avoiding something, there is a painful subconscious program in you. It might be mild. It might be extremely severe somewhere on that spectrum. The more severe the pain is, the more resistance you have to doing it. We all day, every day, we go in, remove it. There's no more pain. And then you just do it. There's no more resistance. If there's no potential pain, you just do it. Um, I can, I can anyone add else on. want to chime Procrast in? Like procrastination is a symptom of a larger problem. So it's not, it's, you have to get, okay, why are it's they It's a symptom of a bad subconscious program. Right. It's tied to pain, a bad and belief can, and feeling. And that can be anything. It can be I procrastinate because I don't feel like, and it, you could procrastinate on different things too. If you procrastinate on, I don't know, getting out of a bad relationship you were in with another person, maybe like that's the type of procrastination, maybe because you don't believe that you're worthy of being with a better person. Maybe you procrastinate on, or or you're afraid of being alone. Yeah, or I don't I don't like this relationship, but it's it's painful relationship, but being alone sucks even more. That's sure. the case for some people. Or procrastinate taking care of your health because you don't believe that it's a you don't have enough value in yourself to take care of yourself, or you procrastinate opening a business because you're worried about you 
you fail. You if you yeah. fail, uh, my yeah. first business fell. I had a lot of talk to chain back then. I felt like an absolute loser for six months. I wasn't yeah. a loser, but I had trauma. So that's the narrative in me. And oh man, yeah. You know, I had a ton of anxiety um, setting up my second business, which did yeah. succeed. Procrastination can come from a lot of different traumas. But so if, so back to, I think Spark asked another question, what would you, the questions you ask or how we figure that out? We would then ask you, okay, what specific things are you procrastinating on? What, and, and you know, are you procrastinating on this? Are you not procrastinating on this? Are you also procrastinating on this thing? Like yeah. we would then kind we, of we find that. the pain that leads to the resistance. Right. And, and so we move it. It's the procrastination is the symptom. We try and get to the cause by figuring out the other stuff that's tied to yeah. it. 100%. 100%. All right. Okay. Um, now you're more familiar with this part of the clip. Is there anything still worth watching here or should we wrap uh, it up? Uh, can't remember. <laughs> what was um, I think it's pretty good. Okay. We're at an hour now. Yeah. Uh, I, he was talking. What was he just talking about? We went off on a tangent. Trauma I, narratives. Yeah, trauma narratives. Oh, no, you yeah, know, I think we covered it. The big thing was the fact that it's you don't want to just ignore it. That you want yeah. to face it. You want to confront it and, and deal with it. And then he got to get to the root. If you don't get to the root, it will continue to grow. That's simple. Yep. Mm -hmm. And um, two very smart guys, Dr. Huberman's been hypnotized many times and Dr. Spiegel does hypnosis, hypnotize himself many, many times. They are both Stanford professors and um, very high up in, in Stanford. Um, Dr. Spiegel, a psychiatrist, as well as doing hypnotism. Uh, Dr. Huberman, a neuroscientist and a neuroscience and ophthalmology professor at Stanford. So they know their stuff. The science is out there. This isn't woohoo with no backing behind it. There is tons and tons and tons of backing. There's less scientific. There are scientific studies on this. There's less than all the other stuff that makes tons of money because guess who funds those studies? The pharmaceutical companies, you know, these big associations, universities that, that see more money in it. When, when people are marketing a service or a product to you, it's not because it benefits you. It's because it benefits them if you buy it. Bingo. So just keep that in mind. These more effective treatments are out there. We do them. We see, I go on my video section, my YouTube channel. I got like 18 in-depth video interviews right now. You can watch clients saying, this is me. I'm showing my face. This is who I am. And listen to their stories. It's freaking amazing. I mean, I was just watching a few the other day because I'm going to compile it into like one video just shows like 18 people, you know, little sound bites. And I'm just like, holy crap, this, this is even better than I remember it. It's even uh, there. The change is bigger than I remember it. But I've done it hundreds of times. Jordan's done it, you know, many times. Tim has done it many times. There's science behind it. It really works. And, you know, mainstream, uh, the mainstream can do whatever the hell they want. We know, we know this is the best way to go. We're doing it and we're changing lives. Uh, we love it. I love it. Tim loves it. Jordan loves it. Any final words, guys? Nope. Plenty words said. All right. So you can learn this. You can have us do sessions for you or you can learn how to do it yourself. Uh, I'm going to do a video on my self-hypnosis course, what's in it next week. If you want that next week, then that'll be coming. Um, you can teach yourself to do this and then master your brain. And then, holy crap, are you going to be shocked? Because you'll realize you never even knew how much power you have. You truly do have more power than you know. That's our show. Thank you.